Winton, you ready to kick things off? Yes, indeed. All right, ready? Welcome, everybody. We're glad to see y'all coming back. You know, we do Exchange Domain. We talk about trivial and significant things with the same type of passion and feeling. Uh, and we're lucky tonight we have two fantastic guests. Dee Dee Bridgewater is full of great stories. Great Chick Corea is full of great stories. And I'm just going <laughs> to kick it off by saying a few things, and then I'm going to just let them have it. And uh, you're going to get a chance to see how we just talk when we're sitting around backstage or the type of conversation that normally goes on. So the first, I'm going to talk about uh, something called the coldest, truest thing you ever heard, that you ever told. So when I was growing up, I'm going to start with my father. And he was always trying to get us to learn traditional New Orleans music. And of course, we're playing in funk bands and we're playing like the music we played in the 1970s. The last thing in the world we wanted to do was play some handkerchief head New Orleans style music. So there was a great trumpet player named Teddy Riley who played the cornet at Louis Armstrong's funeral in 1971. And my father would always say, man, call Buck. His nickname was Buck. Call Buck, man, call Buck. And I wouldn't call Buck. Finally, after like a year, a year and a half or something, he said, man, did you ever call Buck? I said, man, I, I'm not gonna call Buck. Buck can't even read. He said, son, people can either play or they can't play. Mm -hmm. Look at you. You can read. So that kind of stuff oh. is a cold, <laughs> true statement that he would just tell you. So I'm going to tell you all another one before. I, I know I know D.D. has some good ones. Uh, I used to go to John Lewis as the great, the great music director of the Modern Jazz Quartet. I used to go to his home on West End Avenue maybe once or twice a week. I always made a point to go up and, and play with he and his wife, Mariana. She was a fantastic keyboardist, played harpsichord and, and baroque music. And uh, one day I was up there just complaining about some bad reviews I got. And Mr. Lewis was very quiet and considered dignified man. He listened to it for a while, and I kept going maybe a little longer than he wanted to hear it. So then when I would, when I would do that, he would start tinkling on the piano as if to say, hey, man, we heard enough of this. But I was so caught up in my narrative about how wrong I was being done. Then he stopped and he put the, the, the piano, the, the, uh, the, the the covering of the, of the keys over the piano. He said, he said, listen, man, when one goes on and on about themselves, even if it's negative reviews, that is a form of extreme egotism. Could we please get to this music and stop hearing Ooh. about you and how you feel about people's opinion about you? Ooh. So that's, that's two of my cold ones, D.D. What you think about that? Oh, <laughs> um, I think, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stuff that happens when we are young and we don't know. And, and you were getting the words of someone with wisdom and experience. So, <laughs> but I cannot, I can't really pull anything <laughs> up of my own stuff. Wait a minute. I just got a girlfriend that called in. I'm sorry. Um, I can't pull anything up right now because that's, that's kind of cold. What did it make did you, you feel like? Did you know Betty Carter? Did, but did you did you know Betty Carter? I knew Betty Carter. I was Betty <laughs> Carter's puppy dog. I used to follow Betty Carter everywhere. So I didn't experience um, I didn't experience <laughs> Betty like a lot of other people did. Betty kind of uh -huh. let me into her inner circles, but she would never allow me to um, uh -huh. come to any of her rehearsals. So uh -huh. she would always let me know where she was playing in New York when I first moved to New York, and I would always. Uh, reserve a seat at a table by myself and I would just sit and I would just drink her in. Um, I, mm -hmm. do <laughs> I do remember one time we were performing in Brussels and mm -hmm. it was a concert mm -hmm. where she was doing a duet with um, Abby Lincoln. So it was she and Abby for uh -huh. one half of the show and then me for the other half. And um, mm -hmm. we were on an intermission break between the two shows and we <laughs> standing backstage and I said Betty I said you know you did this duet album with Carmen and I said now you're doing these shows with Abby and she said in true Betty fashion with verbiage that we cannot use she said don't <laughs> ask me and I won't have to hurt your feelings <laughs> Ouch. and I said okay Betty I won't ask uh, you can said, I thank you. Let's talk about something else. And that I, got was an it. I got an opposite story. I got an what? opposite kind of story. Uh, but it's, it's a very cool story. So when, <laughs> when, um, talk, talking about uh, uh, our heroes, uh, I remember 
after I played with Mongo Santa Maria's band in uh, 19, uh, 1960, 1960, I think, 1960. Wow. was my first gig uh, with a, a name band in New York. And um, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was thrilling, you know. And then after I worked, uh, the, the, um, the timbali oh. player on Mongo's band at that time was Willie Bobo. You remember Willie Bobo? Yes, yes, I remember Willie. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. His, uh, yeah. his, you know, his last, his real last name is Correa, same as mine, except no. for, except for two R's. He's from Puerto Rico. So, um, um, uh -huh. any, anyway, Willie, uh, Willie formed a, a band uh, after Mongo's band, and he, because he wanted to play, he wanted to play jazz drums. He wanted to be a jazz drummer. So uh, he took me out of the band. Uh, 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 Larry, uh, Larry, who played with Monk, Larry. Gales. I don't know. Larry, Larry Gales. Gales. Larry Gales was the bass player. Um, uh -huh. Joe Farrell was the tenor player. Uh, uh, I think Marty Shello was the trumpet player. Uh, and we had this quintet, so we played at uh, uh, we played at Birdland. We got a Birdland gig. And so uh, mm -hmm. after after one of the nights at Birdland, uh, you know, I'm I'm so new in New York, and I'm trying to find my footing. I don't know, am I doing good or not doing good? Uh, I'm enjoying the excitement of it, and I'm, it's a, after, the, after the night, after the two sets or three sets, however long we played, and I'm at the bar nursing a drink. I think I was the last guy there, and I see down at the, down at the other end of the bar, some, some guy starts walking toward me, and I, I recognized him when he came halfway. It was Tommy Flanagan, uh, who was one of my heroes. My Hawaiian piano hero. So Tommy comes up to me, and all all he all he did was he he kind of he kind of pointed at me, and he said, "Man, you got some fresh ideas." And he turned around and he walked away. And, and that was I, it. I was on a cloud for two weeks. That's the kind of thing that that kept me going in New York. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. beautiful. What, a, what about you, Didi? What have you? That's an opposite uh -huh. story. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good sometimes story. the opposite that's thing can have the story. same effect. You know, sometimes somebody tell you something cold, it makes you practice. Sometimes they're real friendly, it makes you. That's like the African chief. They gave him some ice. He said, "Bits of fire." Right, right, so right, what, right. I got a good one. Which, which I have you a got, really you got? good one, guys. Uh -huh. Okay, um, when Cecil Bridgewater and I first married, um, Cecil had also been hired into Horace Silver's quintet. So instead of us doing a honeymoon, we did this tour. And um, uh, I was quite enamored with Horace Silver. I, I, I just love Horace's work. I love his compositions. So um, we're doing this tour and Andy Bay, of course, is the singer. And we get to Detroit. Um, I'm from Flint, Michigan. So we get to Detroit and of course, all my family is coming up from, from Flint because they want to number one, meet my new husband. And then number two, hear him play in Horace Silver's band. And then my, some of my cousins have said, and maybe you'll sing. And so Andy and I decided before we got to Detroit that I was going to sit in. And this was when he had the United States of Mind albums going. And so um, this was the first album of that. I think it was a trilogy, wasn't it? Uh -huh. But at any rate, it doesn't matter. The song we had selected was Love Vibrations. And so Horace had a tendency when he played to play with his head down and his hair would just be in his face and so he wouldn't see. Right. So I don't know why Andy and I thought if he can't see, he can't hear. Uh -huh. So I had asked <laughs> Horace if I could sit in and he had told me no, absolutely oh. not. Mm -hmm. And so uh -huh. Andy and I had decided He's not going to stop us if I'm singing. So um, he starts <laughs> the intro to Love Vibrations. And we're in a club in Detroit. I don't know what club. I can't remember the club. But at any rate. And so when it starts, emptiness surrounds my lonely heart. I start singing. I got to, it surrounds my lonely heart. And to sing Life Has Lost Its Room. I go, and, and he looks up. <laughs> <laughs> and he turns and he looks at me and he says, 
what are you doing on my stage? Get uh -huh. off. Get Ooh. off now. Ouch. Get off in front of all my family oh. and my friends oh. and my new husband oh. and the band. <laughs> Oh. And Andy is standing on the side. So oh. I just kind of slithered off stage. Yeah. But from that moment, I said, I'm going to prove to Horace Silver that I can sing his music. He's mm. got such a close idea about who can interpret his music. And, and so instead of it making me feel bad, because I knew I was wrong, because he'd already told me no. Uh -huh. I just decided I'm gonna prove to him. So then, when I decided, when we fast forward, that was in the seven. That was 1971. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 1995, and I called him, you know, and told him. I said, I'm gonna do a whole album of your music, and he says, I can't. I, you know, I, 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 I can't believe it. I can't believe it. A woman wants to. Do, yeah. I can't believe a woman wants to wants to honor me. How come yeah. it's none of my musicians? And I said, Horace, I am a musician. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's beautiful. But that, that, was, that was a bad story that had a great ending. What is what a sweetheart. Hey, Didi, 1971, uh, 1971, check it out. You. Oh, you mean when. You and Andy. Go ahead. You and Andy, 1971. What else happened yeah. in 1971 with you and Andy and me and Stanley? And, and Stanley. Right. Unexpected days and sea That's journey. Right. That's right. That was when we first met. Yep. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> Coming up to your apartment, Stanley and I would meet you, and Ayerto and Flora would come. You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's this right. Before, were you a baby, Winton? Were you a baby? What were you? Were you born? 1971, Winton. <laughs> no, I was, I, I was 10. Yeah, you were 10? I was, he was, old I was 10, but I like hearing about it. You were, you were probably yeah. playing. Like a, that was still probably, a long time ago. <laughs> you were probably playing like a demon at 10. Were you playing the dog? No, no, man, I was terrible. I, I love hearing about it, though. Oh, yeah, well, well, uh, I mean. I love, that, I love hearing, but go ahead, don't, don't stop. Well, I mean, uh, that, that, was a, that was a memorable session. Uh, that was Stanley's first, uh, first um, that was his solo first, album. That was his first solo album. Yeah, I produced that. I, you know, I have this producing technique that I did with Stanley, and I've done it with uh, uh, some others. It's, it's a really cool technique. I recommend it. What, 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 what I did with Stanley uh, is I sat down with Stanley and I said, Stanley, you got to make a record, man. You, you're, you're amazing. Uh, all right. He said, yeah, yeah, I want to make a record. So, uh, so I said, okay, what do you want to do? Like, what, 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 do you, what, what's, what, what, what would you like to do? You, and, and all I recommended was that he write music. And that's all I did to produce. And he just came up with that record. I didn't do anything. I, I uh, played on it and I was in the studio. That's how you produce a guy like Stanley Clark. <laughs> you just so with the young, he, cool. brought, he brought you in, Didi, and he brought Andy Bay in. And I got yep. to meet you guys. And that was, uh, was a great experience. You know, that's where I met, um, that's where I met Bertie Kirsch uh, on, on, uh, on that. Um, uh, on that album. On yeah, that. yeah, he was he was an engineer at the Electric Lady Studios. Did we do that at Electric Lady? Do where not ask me that kind of a detail. Okay. I don't remember where we did that. <laughs> I don't have okay. a clue. Where did we do that? Was it Electric Lady? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. But I got a Horace Silver story. You want to okay. hear a horror, you want to hear yeah, a horror, yeah. I have a couple yeah. of Horace Silver story. I'll tell you the earliest one. Okay. Uh, Earliest one was when I was in high school uh, in 50, 58, 57, 58, 59 in Boston. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a jazz club there called Storyville. Mm -hmm. Story, Story, you remember Storyville? Storyville? I mean, I remember hearing about it. I never went. I think it was George gone Wien. by the time I was old George enough. Wien, that's right. George, George Wien. Wien. George. Yeah, that's George Wien's first venue. And uh, right. uh, he promoted, he brought all of these great, this great music in um, uh, to Storyville. So, so uh, you know, Horace Silva Quintet came in uh, one week. And, and I, at that point, I had devoured every Horace record that came out. And I, I was already transcribing Horace tunes and learning his solos and learning Blue Mitchell solos. And, and uh, that, that was a real training ground for me. So, so me and my buddy, we went early in the afternoon, we went 
like four o'clock in the afternoon, we went to uh, to the uh, I think it was the Bradford Hotel uh, to see if there was anything going on. You know, we peeked in the in the window. It was dark inside, but the door was open. So we opened the front door and we see a dark club and there's this one light at the piano with Horace sitting at the piano composing. He had a pencil uh, and he was working something out, right? So me and my buddy, we, we snuck in the front door and we, uh, I'm, I'm getting emotional about this. And we, 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 we sat in the back, we just tucked ourselves in the back. And man, for the next hour, we sat quietly and observed Horace write a tune. Check that wow. out. Wow. That's right. Him, him working it out on the piano and then him writing some stuff down and then him working it out some more and then him write. And that, came, that tune came out on Further Explorations, his next, his next record. But, what uh, was the tune? Which, which one was it? It was one of the tunes on Further Explorations. Uh, but, okay. But, but that was, a, that was like, a, that was like a, an incredible, like, that's the university that, that, that I loved going to. That, right. uh, well, well I, you know I, what I was wonderful about oh i'm sorry go no, on no, no go ahead go ahead no go ahead no i i just wanted to just to make this this little statement what was wonderful about um the music uh, when i came along i came along on the tail end of this whole real real true sense of of community and family where um as soon as a young musician would come on the scene they were just taken in by the older musicians and and were protected um, and 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 uh, the older musicians would share all kinds of information with 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 the young musicians that could be useful and it and and it was also the period um, I came in on the end of of people sitting in at concerts you know you would go to a concert and one of the beauties of going to a concert in the early 70s is you never knew who was going to come out on the stage. Mm -hmm. of the artist uh -huh. concert that yeah. you went to. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's and that right. was beautiful. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I came along after y'all, but I have to say that uh, the musicians always always treated me like that. Like, I, you know, if, if I talk about John Lewis or Art Blakey or any of the musicians, even, even recently, I, I started to really know Chick later, but it still was automatically mm -hmm. a familial type of feeling and a kind of love. Uh, did exist because of the music. With, with Horace Silver, I used to see him. He, he, we, one, one year I called him and asked him if he would judge a high school jazz band festival and competition we have every year. It's called Essentially Ellington. So it's, it's rooted in Duke's music, but we play a lot of other, pe a, a lot of other mm -hmm. music as we go along. So Horace came and he was one of our judges. And the, the, the judging scale is from like one to 10. So most of the time you give kids, you know, a good, good bands get eights, nines, almost never tens, eight. but seven, eights, yep. and nines. Kind of medium bands will get seven, six. Really, really bad bands will get fives or fours. You know, you almost never give yes. anything lower than a five. You uh -oh. don't want to give a five. Uh -oh. Then we oh, came from the first round of, of judges. <laughs> and it's like five of us judges, we sitting in the room and we putting the scores up. You know, we got like eights and nines and Horace got like twos and threes. <laughs> yep. and once. Yep. So they said, so, so everybody started looking around. They said, man, you got to talk to her. So I said, man, I don't, I don't want to talk to him. You know, you talk to him. He said, no, no, talk to her. I said, okay. <laughs> so I, I talked to her. So I said, uh, Mr. Silva, I'm, we, don't, we don't normally give kids uh, twos and, and, and threes and ones and stuff like that. You know, we, we try to, to come from more encouraging them. We don't, we don't try. And he listened to me very patiently. He said, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. And when I got finished talking to him, we came back the next round. And, man, he was, bam, hitting people with twos. And, <laughs> fours and, and threes, his highest score was like a four. Yeah. I said, man, you know, we got to the end of the judge and he looked at me and he said, look, man, when I was coming up, people could play when they were 18 and 17. He said, people like Lee Morgan. So he started naming all the people who could play. He oh, said, you right. got to hold these kids to a standard. Yeah. This is my score. I'm giving them twos and threes. So to this day, that might have been 15, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, whoever gives the lowest score as a judge, we say that they have won the Horace Silver Award. <laughs> but you know, Horace was, a, Horace was a beautiful cat too. He would yeah. come to gigs all the time. He came to the last time my son was a gig, we played in Los Angeles at Royce Hall. He came and had a lot of, a lot of really intelligent, insightful comments about the music. Like what about just uh, one thing, I'm a, a subject I want to get on 
the, the thing I noticed when I was growing up, because I grew up more in the funk era, but I always noticed how intelligent the jazz musicians were. Like I could mm -hmm. stand around because my father's a musician. I would hear Dizzy talk or Art Blakey talk or Sweet Edison mm -hmm. or Woody Herman or, you know, all the musicians he would play with. And it was always kind of yep. shocking to me, the intelligence of the, of the musicians. So what you got for me in terms of just when you were talking to somebody and you realize just the depth of their intelligence, D.D.? Yeah, yeah. Hey, check oh, this shit. out. Hey, Winton. Winton, while you were talking, yeah. I came across a little thing on my wall. I don't, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see it. See that, that? I I can see it if you come a little closer. Bring the phone closer. Uh, well, I, I'm, I've got a whatever it is. I've got a laptop. Anyway, that I'm going to tell you what that is because it's about competitions, and and uh, it. it's a it's a photograph uh -huh. of Bela Bartok. Mm -hmm. right? And and the quote uh -huh. that the quote that Bartok says on it is, "Competitions are for horses, not artists." Ooh. Ouch. Uh, yeah. yeah. I like you that. Know, <laughs> I, I, I like it. I like it on a certain level, but on another level, I, I kind of, I think it's long as you, long as you don't think that it means the end all or be all of stuff. And that to me, that means that he probably lost a couple of them and made him mad. And yeah, I, I, but don't I know. think it's. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I beg to differ a little bit. Uh, I beg to differ. Uh -huh. You, you have to have thick skin. Uh -huh. in, order, in order to, in order to, you know, be easy with the, uh, uh, they like you, they don't like you, they're up and down. Right. You got to be easy. But I, I do agree with with your philosophy of encouraging, being in, encouraging. I don't think criticism of, of uh, I don't think criticism of uh, other musicians or young artists gets them very much. Personally. I think that I think criticism. Well, I agree with that. If, if, if it's constructive, I think that criticism can be helpful. You know, if you, if you, if I you, I mean, what I try to do is, is if I want to say something about, um, of course, I do a lot of uh, vocal workshops. So if I want to say something to uh, a young singer who I feel is, is, is lacking in some areas, what I try to do is to try to find some kind of positive way to get uh, w the area where I think that this particular person needs to improve. I try to find something that is positive that can uh, open them up so that they can be receptive to a, 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 a positive right. criticism. What's a positive so I, I try and do it so I that the, the takeaway is going to be positive, What's no matter what you say. Give me an example of a positive criticism. Don't come in here playing like that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I, 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 I would just. I'll tell you, story. I got a great story. I got a great story. Freddie right. Hubbard, you ready? <laughs> Freddie Hubbard at, at the both end oh, in San Freddie. Francisco. Yeah. Freddie Hubbard, Freddie Hubbard. He's up on stage playing, uh, playing with, with uh, I don't know, it was a jam, I guess. Freddie, Freddie's playing. And uh, uh, it, 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 there was a jam session, and a, a, a line of uh, a horn players were coming up playing, right? Right. So, so I guess he was getting a little bit tired of it, and and uh, this one guy came up with his trumpet, getting ready to play, and Freddie Freddie did did, did I, I used to love the way Freddie Lou look at these guys. He 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 go, <laughs> right, right. You know. And yes. So he goes. He goes. Ding 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 da da do di da da ding 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 da da and then rips off two of the most unbelievable trumpet choruses you ever heard in your life. Right. And then turns to the guy. Yeah, like and smile. It was. I love Freddie. It was a withering experience. It was a withering experience. <laughs> that, look, that, that could have worked back then. Now that's, that kind of stuff doesn't work. <laughs> if somebody can come up and can't play their horn at all and they'll play 50 choruses. But I, I right. think in terms of the positive criticism, a long time ago when I was, I was in my tw early, I was like 24 or something, but I was teaching a master class of classical music to a kid who was in high school. So I was kind of close to him in age, but I'd already had a record out. And he was the, the best trumpet player there and every time he would play something, I would stop him and tell him something negative. And Ooh. it was kind of the method, more or less, that I had learned. Just so he played, I okay. tell him negative. Played, I tell him negative. Played, I tell him negative. 
And I could tell it was kind of getting to him because he was really respected in his school. And he was very respectful and nice. So he wasn't the type of person that you wanted to mess with. And I really wasn't trying to mess with him. I was just trying to say, you didn't do this right. You didn't breathe right. You didn't this. So after a while, it just got to be too much for him. And he looked at mm -hmm. me and he said, Mr. Marcellus, may I respectfully ask that you teach me from the positive frame of reference? And I never forget that because when he told me that, I, I, it was a lesson for me. Wow. So I told him, I said, man, you know, I don't really know how to teach you from the positive frame of reference. But from this time, I start to try to always, when I teach a lesson, I talk to somebody, I try to always acknowledge what they can do and what it is exactly. that they are able to do and say, use what you're able to do to educate yes. what you cannot do. Because if I don't yes. tell you what you can do, I can't teach you a lesson. It can't all be positive reinforcement. But I always like to start in the positive, in the, from, from what yes. he said, the positive frame of reference. That's a really good yeah. philosophy, man. That's, That's a very, very good. And, and I think I agree. With an, that. another thing is good also, Chick, it's, it's good for people to see we could have a conversation and we don't have to agree on everything. And we don't have to demonize each other. Yeah. Like it's, right. I think in our public life, it's so little a disagreement as to always be. It's always like if you don't agree with everything somebody says, you're their enemy or you hate them. Yeah. We talk about plenty of things we don't agree on. It It doesn't mean your, your opinion or your thoughts or anything or any less look important how, or valuable than anybody else. Look you, know? at how different right. in the, you look at how different in the music world each one of us creates our music, just like really mm -hmm. completely differently. We have different approaches. Uh, this electric, acoustic, uh, fast, slow, pop, not pop, far out, far in. Right. I don't know. We, you know, you can't put words to it, but uh, it's it's the creative thing that you want to get out of everybody. Everybody's got a right. different uh, a different talent and a different dream. I agree. Oh, I just thought of something. That's right. Okay, That's I right. just thought of something. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It was like <laughs> 1996. Chick. I think we were in Oregon. Um, that particular year, we did several festivals that where we were on the same bill on the same day. That's right, that's right, I remember. And we were riding to the festival together. And you said to me, I don't know how we started, got into this conversation, but we were talking about jazz clubs. I was living in France. And um, you said, Dee Dee, you need to start doing the jazz clubs. And I said, chick, but I don't do clubs. I only do concert work. I don't want to do clubs. And you said to me something that forever changed the way I thought and think about doing club work. You said, Dee Dee, if we don't go into those jazz clubs and we don't play in those jazz clubs, those club owners are not going to be able to make the money that they need for the lesser known artists to come in and to get their start. I'm kind of paraphrasing. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. Yeah, I do remember that. But, and, but you know and, what I do? Huh? I'm sorry. I agree Go ahead. Saying, well, I, no, I remember that, Dee Dee. But, but I remember the one a festival we played, and this kind of ties into Winton, in a sense, because uh, do you remember the drummer that you had during that time? That's when I met Ali. Ali Jackson. Yeah. That's right. Oh my God. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. Ali that's, right. that's right. That's right. Ali was with me. Yeah, that's right. That's why I first first hooked up with Ali, and that that's uh, that was Winton's drummer for many years. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's I got a. I, I that's right. Say, uh, I got another horror story. Can we do another horror story? <laughs> is, is this going to be the horror <laughs> show? Maybe this is the no. horror silver show. Sometimes those are. The Horace was Sometimes those a, are the best ones. <laughs> he was such a he was such a big 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 uh, inspiration and influence. I, I, I fortunately I got to meet him later on. I got two stories. I mean later on what happened. I mean, you remember the old Catalinas on the right. in yes. LA? Uh, the uh, on on Hawanga. Yeah, I had mm -hmm. a gig there one time with my trio with uh, with Abishai Cohen and Jeff Ballard, and we uh -huh. the trio at that point was like a really tight group, and I had written a lot yeah. of. A lot of stuff for the, for that trio, and and I swear, man, it was one of the memorable sets of my life. Because you know when you you know when you got a group, and after you played a lot of gigs, uh, uh, in a row, you the 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 group gets greased up. Yes. And 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 you know before you're gonna walk out on stage, what's gonna be delivered. You you mm -hmm. know that it's gonna. I mean, you have no 
question that that stuff is going to smoke. It's just right, going right. to, you know, it's just, it's there now. So we, we were at that point at Catalina's and um, who, who appears in the audience at one table, but just one Herbie, table, Herbie Hancock, um, uh, Herbie Hancock, Greg Filling Danes, Billy Childs, and Laura <laughs> <Lamar> Silver. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and they, they all came down to check me out and check my trio out. And you know, the trio smoked. I know you all did. I know you and, turned up the heat. And we blew everybody away. And it was, it was, and Horace was so, so uh, uh, encouraging and so, and so validating. But here's my story with ha Horace. Uh, with Horace, what happened is, is uh, uh, since he first started playing with Miles Davis, uh, uh, and then and then right, I mean, it was right around that time that he and Art Blakey got together, and they were really the first jazz messengers. Uh, right. uh, Har Silver uh, wrote the music to uh, mm -hmm. to uh, that those recordings, right. So anyway, I followed Horace's music and his albums all the way through every album I got. I learned all of the songs on his albums. I was just totally into Horace. So by, by the time I moved to New York in 59, by 1964, uh, Horace, Horace's band was at the top of his game around, around 64. Mm -hmm. and he, had, he had Blue Mitchell, Junior Cook, uh, Roy Brooks, and Gene Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but what, what, what happened is the Horace would take some time off and uh, the, the group, you know, Blue, Blue Mitchell and Junior, they wanted to keep working. So they, they, they put a group together with the four of them, Gene, Taylor, uh -oh. Roy Brooks, uh, Blue Mitchell and Junior Cook, and they needed a piano player. Uh -oh. I don't know how, I still <laughs> to this day don't know how I got that gig. I don't know who recommended me, but I ended up in that piano chair. And I uh -oh. work. I work with Blue Mitchell's group. I mean, with uh, Horace Silver's group, minus Horace Silver for a couple of years. And and can you imagine the 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 amazing experience that that was for me? Right. To right. To follow in my total hero's footsteps into a band of his musicians. That was like, you know, top university. Wow. We played Mittens. We used to do these six week six week stints at Mittens. We do, wow. we do three, four sets a night, starting at 10 o'clock at night, going to yes. four and five in the morning. Yes. Oh, man, that was a great period. That was a great period. You know, you something about, about sometimes you have a band or people get hook up and they get together, the impact that it can have on, uh, on audiences, you know. It's, and this, I remember I played with a septet, and we, we reached a certain point where we would be playing. Man, it would be like uh, we played on the airplane. The airplane had to stop. We were going to to Buenos Aires and something happened and the st plane stopped in Europe where we were just stuck on the plane. Everybody pulled their horns out and started playing. Yeah. The people just went, people on the plane just went, went crazy. We played yeah. outside in, a, in Ukraine or somewhere in Eastern Europe. It, it, was, it was late at night, the restaurants was closed. And we said, man, maybe if we pull our horns out, we'll get the guy to open the restaurant up. We started playing. He opened the restaurant up and cooked food for us. <laughs> and it yes. just, like you were saying, sometimes with you, when you get a group, you get a, a certain kind of a, uh, just just a, a relationship, a thing that happens. And it's just uh, like that band had Reginald Veal and Hurl and Riley and mm. Wes Anderson, you know, just the, the vibe of, of, of people playing it. Cats will come come check it out. I remember Milt Jackson came down to check us out one night. Milt! And, and, and you know, we'd always be excited whenever people come. Dizzy would come to a gig. I yeah. can just remember gigs that, that, that great musicians showed up to your yeah. gig, Sweet Edison or anybody that, that you respect, that you respected when they showed up to, to a gig. Yeah. And, uh, Man, didn't that what, make you feel proud? To what Didi was saying, yeah, you know, all the musicians. I, I had a chick. It's one one thing. I'm, I'm gonna just tell this story about when the musicians older than you give you that kind of love. When I was 18, George Weenie booked me on a gig to play with Mel Torme, and you know, I just come to New York. I was I'm a, I was just turned 18, and I couldn't really play on card changes. You know, I was kind of pentatonic. And, and the, the, the contractor had told Mel, told me, man, I don't know how this kid got on the gig because he can't play. Because the contractor knew me from playing some classical music. And Mel, the first song we played was called One Morning in May. And it was in the key of, of, of D, trumpet E. 
course, I didn't know how to play it E at all, but I just played something chromatic or something. Mel stopped the, 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 the whole orchestra and everybody and said, man, this kid can play. So, you know, for all those years after that, when I saw Mel Torme, he would always look at me and say, one morning in May. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Je nice. Jerry Mulligan around that same time, I met him in Seattle. And he and I, when he met me, he said, man, you the kid from New Orleans. I said, yeah, and he said, man, you know how to play that counterpoint? And I was thinking, wow, it was like, it was like, it was like a kid. I said, yeah, let's see. You know, we played contrapuntal pieces. And I think of all the years that passed, I would see Jerry all the time, all of the different conversations we had, how serious they would be. And they all go back to those early years. So I think when I see DDU and Chick talk, and y'all go back to, you know, 1971, this time that I met you, it's hard kind of for people, if you don't have all those years under, under your belt, you don't realize the type of impact that these long-term relationships have as they play out across time. That's so, right. This is true. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. That's a good thing. point. That's a good point, Wenton. It's true. Beautiful thing. We have, a, a, the, you know, the, the musicians, the musicians I find, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've got this pride of being a musician. And uh, because musicians like, like uh, and artists that spend their lives at it, like Dee Dee, like Dee Dee and Winton, like you guys, and like our friends that we, who we know that spend their life at it. I, I think we all have um, an unspoken, tacit uh, uh, agreement about what we're doing. We don't put it in words. We all agree right. on that. And I see it I see it as a kind of mission. And I talk to the young people like that, uh, you know, young musicians who are, uh, who are uh, it, really interested to, to do something, but they're scared to commit themselves to a lifetime or, or really get deep about it. And I, and I try to explain to them the, the fulfillment of, of being a part of this, uh, this tacit agreement of making people feel good and inspiring them like that and inspiring each other. It's really a great gig we've got. It's a, it's right. a, great, it's a great gig. Well, I want to I wanna pick up on what you're saying and ask Didi something because what? I've, I've seen her. I mean, you have such a tremendous range in your singing and also you, you're bilingual, maybe trilingual. I don't know how many languages you speak, but I know you speak French. I can sing in French. more languages than I can speak. <laughs> you know, but but I but one thing I notice about your singing is you're able to affect many different characters. So I was thinking about when Chick said that we know what feeling we want to create. So mm -hmm. I just want to ask you: Do you do you try to create a different feeling when you're in another language, or is the feeling the same but just the language is different? Oh, I try and create a different feeling with with every song that I do, and. Um, when I sing, um, I'm of course most comfortable when I sing in French at, because I spent so many years there and, and that really is my second language. So I'm, I'm fairly comfortable when I sing in French, but I have to say I've been doing some French songs um, recently with, with my trio and it was very interesting when we would switch from the songs in English to the songs in French, I would take on this kind of French attitude, which is kind of hard to say, I mean, for people to understand if you haven't lived in France, but I mean, there's, there was, there, and, and the way that you pronounce the words. And, and so it, it, it brings up other kinds of emotions because um, you have to treat the language so much more different than you would if you were speaking in, in English. So I would say, when you sing in another language, when I sing in French or when I sing in Spanish or when I sing in Italian, what I have noticed that I do most is, is I take on the ambiance of people that I have seen sing in those languages, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then I try and paint a picture for the, the listening audience who may not know the language, and so they're going to only be reacting from a visceral point or an emotional uh, uh, point. Um, I just try and create <clears throat> a kind of, of, of scenario, or I try and do gestures with words that suggest what the word is that I'm, I'm, I'm saying, so that these people in the end, when the song is finished, even if they don't know it, 
they've had an emotional reaction to it because mm -hmm. of the way that I presented it. So mm -hmm. um, that's what I do. But for me, I was thinking, and I was talking with this about the, the, the young musicians that I'm working with in my trio. Um, I think of it as, you know, for me, I'm a musician. You know, um, I, use, I use words, you know, but I also have to know the music. I have to know the melody. I have to know, I have to have an understanding of all the chord changes and stuff so that I can waltz around in, in, in that world. But I was saying to, to these, these young people, I said, you know what? When we're, when we're performing this music, you don't know what I'm saying. So I want you to just watch me, watch my body. My body's gonna tell the story. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you know, you'll be able to apply you know, the, 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 the kinds of hits that you need to, to at a certain moment, just because of that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the fact that you can't understand what I'm saying. That's not important. When you go mm -hmm. to a, uh, when you go to the opera, you hear an opera in, in Italian, you don't know what they're saying, mm -hmm. you know, or you <laughs> hear a French opera. opera, you don't know what they're saying, <laughs> or you hear a German opera, you don't know what they're saying. I love you. Why and did so you break you, my heart? Where, did, where did he go? <laughs> exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? So what do we react to? The emotion that is being projected by the people that are spewing out these words in the, in, right. in the, in the, in the situations that they're in. So, yeah. I've never gotten think, comfortable with people watching while I'm playing. <laughs> really? What did you say, Chick? You know, I mean, I, I never, I've never thought about body language or anything. And, and when, I, when I see myself on a video, uh, you know, I go, oh, yeah, you know, maybe well, I ought to do something with that, you know. <laughs> well, wait, so you talk about that, and that brings me to your Spanish hearts. <laughs> oh, you remember well, you what I told you after I saw you at, at North Sea? I was so freaked out. I just loved it so much. Do you remember what I said, Chick? Do you remember what I said? No, you don't remember what I don't said. Don't put him on his butt. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just tell you again. No, I was so moved by by the band and by the performance and also by the way that you had everybody set up on the stage. So it was this um, an enormous cluster. But it was it was visually so sumptuous. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Um, and I just I, I just I was so swept away by by the visual aspect because the music was already insane for me and, and then to see the way that you had clustered everybody together and it was this like have you seen this Winton? have you seen him do it oh I, yeah i've seen him oh my I, god the I, spanish hearts got, got the great mikey rodriguez yeah Ooh! i've, I've, I've Ooh! Thank you, you know i've got the i've got the same i've got the same kind of love for uh for pulling a group together that Winton does. Yeah. Winton, mm -hmm. I know that when, when I first came and worked with, with Winton, uh -huh. uh, with the band, the thing that, I, that, that uh, one of the things that struck me was the, the, way, the way Winton had his musicians or, kind of uh, organized into a group that really was, it was a group, but everybody was an individual. And, yes. and, and, and encourage everybody to really be themselves and somehow pull it together with the repertoire yes. and so forth, you know. And, uh, but I love that, Dee Dee. Thank you for that compliment. That means as much to me as, uh, as what Tommy Flanagan said. <laughs> but it's, but, but here's, here's the thing, because here's something that I have always felt, guys, if you will allow me. Something that I, I have always uh, felt has been kind of detrimental to our music uh, is the visual component. And there are not enough musicians out there playing that add a visual component to the performance when we're doing concerts or even in a club setting that it, it, it draws the audience in. And- um, Well, give me some I, advice. Oh, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with this hair? What do I wear? Uh, I'm no, not talking I'm, about I'm that kid. chick, you no, are so she's, silly. She's, she's so silly. She's I'm talking, talking about some, sometimes. Tell sometimes him, yes, so, so she, she talk, sometimes people on the bandstand, if they're not playing, they look like they want to be somewhere else, or there's there's a loss of integrity. They really listen to intensity. 
and give yourself over to the to the to the music yes. as if uh you mm -hmm. know, all we got going for us is music. If we don't have like light shows, if we don't have a, we don't have different degrees of nudity we can get into. Ah, well, you got we better. Oh, you got to. <laughs> you got we got to. We got to be playing. You know, we got to also. We can't have half our group that's not soloing, acting like they'd rather be at home. Thank you. And uh, it's yeah. such a blessing to play. And, and yeah. if you listen to musicians, they're so great. If you really listen to what somebody else is playing, and follow them on a gig, you've had such a such a better time listening to, to the other musicians play. Mm -hmm, that's right. You know, it's so much more fun than just sitting up there waiting for yourself to play. That's right. Yes. It, you know, you go home with a hollow feeling when you've done that. Yeah. But when you listen to other people, it's so, because it, people are coming up with so many unbelievable things. Right. That's right. And right. Uh, you know, what Chick, Chick is saying, yeah, I mean, I've been blessed. My musicians, I love them with such an intensity because of the enjoyment I've had playing with them. Yes, and it's, it's not even it's not like a kind of you know music is such a spiritual thing. But you were which all what you were saying, and everything we've said tonight, you know, chick, what you were saying about the musicians and your relationship with with Horace, and now you can remember when Herbie and them came to the gig and sat down, and everything is so personal. And Dee Dee talking about the musicians and how it was like a family, but if you think about it, it's really still like that. I mean, we just got to figure out how I think this space that we have has allowed us the opportunity to really think about what we have, because I know when I got with Chick, and he came with the band. He went on the road with them without me, and they loved him. They were calling me every night talking about all the what he played, what he was teaching people about playing in the rhythm and what mm -hmm. they learned from checking him out. And I know mm -hmm. with you, when, when Ali was with you, are you playing with Urban Mayfield and all the musicians mm -hmm. you play with? They love you, and they talk about you in a very familiar way. How they mm -hmm. gonna, what you're going to do for them and all the stuff you did for New Orleans and you did to keep everything going down there. So I think it's still there. We just got to figure out how to let more people know that's actually how we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Yeah, I am in agreement. I'm in agreement. Nice. You know, Chick writes me some of the most beautiful notes, and I want to say it while I, while I have him here, and and Gail too. If something uh, happens, you know, and it does not doesn't have to be something major like the death of my father. It could just be he heard a record or he did this or he did. In the midst of all that he has to do, in the midst of all of what Gail is doing, she will write me a note, and she uses a lot of icons in her notes. So it's always <laughs> you're always happy when you read them. You know? <laughs> But it'll be, it's so thoughtful. And this is the thing that, uh, yes, that, that, uh, that I was told a long time ago by Pearl, Pearl Bailey when she, mm. she was with Louis Belson. She, we play a jazz festival together and she came backstage. She, I was on the same bill at what kind of cool jazz festival and she brought me a gift. And she said, I brought you this gift because I wanted you to know that this is how we used to treat each other. And then mm -hmm. I was maybe 25 or 26. So, mm. I don't, I don't buy people gifts, but I still think about it. That's beautiful, man. That's really beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice hanging with you, too. It isn't a lot of fun. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, we're we going to open it up for some questions. And then okay. maybe some people just be, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of some questions. I don't know. Adam is going to tell me what's happening. Okay, that, this is good. That sounds what about saying, right. Adam? Yeah, 10 or 15 minutes is, is, I think, right on schedule. So we've got a number of people with, with their hands raised. So those of you who do have a question to ask, um, we'll try and get to, to as many as we can. We might not have a t enough time for everybody, but we'll, we'll get going on it right now. So the first question uh, coming in is from Robbie Wheeler. Um, Robbie, go ahead. Hi, Winton. It's Robbie Wheeler. I'm from Milwaukee. Uh, I recently uh, met you at the last concert here in December after uh, – my son couldn't come with me. You actually signed his ticket saying, Andrew, do your homework, man. <laughs> and uh, I've just, I've had so many opportunities over the years to watch you perform, meet you at the concerts. And I just wanted to say, first of all, that all of that time has been so appreciated to me. The first time was in 1998. I was a grad student at the time. And uh, over the years, you've uh, given my boys countless memories as we look at these pictures with you guys. And uh, so I just appreciate that time and uh, just want you to know that I've talked to them about just how humble you are and your character over the years. And I think that you've shown your father through that in our countless meetings. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate that time that you've taken for uh, my boys and myself after all. Mm. Uh, and I think everybody would agree that you are a representative of your father in, in how you handle yourself both on stage and off stage. Um, well, my, my question for you is, is you've talked so much about all of these 
uh, things that you've done over the years, these great memories. And I'm kind of wondering how you feel you're currently growing as a musician. You know, the, it's easy to look from the outside and say, you're, you're Winton Dallas, man. You, you know what there is to know about the industry, about playing jazz. But any educated person also knows that the more you know, the less you know. And I'm kind of wondering, what do you feel is sort of the next step for you? Are there things that you're hoping to embark on to help you grow as a musician? Sure. To, well, first, thank you for, for, your, for your comments. But it's just to, to, uh, to become better. <laughs> like, if you, if you think, Dee Dee, I was saying, I was listening to her and I was checking out just the type of way she inhabits songs, okay? And I'm, I'm trying to, I was, was, was thinking, if, you know, if I could play my horn and inhabit these songs like that and play with that type of, uh, in one minute it's very effusive and in the next second it's very intimate. Or just with Chick being on the, on the, on the phone, Chick and I had a conversation maybe, I don't know, four, three or four months ago about writing classical pieces and working together on a piece. And when I see him, he's talking about coming to New York in 1959 and <laughs> he's still practicing and playing and thinking about music and writing and, excited about stuff. I saw, I saw a chick, and I'm, this is what I think about this. So you asked me the question about how do I want to grow as a musician? We played a gig in France, and we played after Chick played. Now that gig started at 10 o'clock, so, so he's already on European time, so, which is six, five, six hours after American time. So it's basically two or three in the morning where he's coming from. He has an hour ride on a bus back to his hotel. He stayed around after his gig, and heard our band, where I had some of my young students from Juilliard who really could play. He stayed around after the gig and then commented on the songs and said, man, that one second movement where y'all played something about belief. He remember the name of the song. Now this was just last summer. And I just looked at him and said, damn, you know, I, I hope I can maintain that type of integrity about music. So he played a gig already. And, and it, then it's like one or two in the morning in France. And I just, uh. You know, I mean, I'm humbled by the fact that he'll get on the phone with us tonight and have that type of enthusiasm. And it's the same way that he approaches it. And it's the same way Dee Dee approaches songs and dealing with the music, that type of youthfulness and liveliness. So that's what I'm working on. And I, I mean, I'll throw it over to Chick because I'm, I'm talking about him, but, but tell him how true that story is, Chick. Yeah, that, that, was, that was sweet. But the, do you remember, I, that, wasn't that the night I sat in with, your, with, with the group? That, that's right, you sat in at the end. <laughs> I, played the, I played with that amazing young piano player, man. He showed me the Isaiah. He, Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah. He showed me the changes as we were doing it. <laughs> oh, and, how fabulous. That's yeah, right. Yeah. But, he, but he waited to the end of the gig and came out and played. I forgot that you actually would have at the end. Yeah, that so that's, that's but that makes example. sense. It has to be at the end, Wenton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. He fun. couldn't come in because it would be it would it would disrupt it would disrupt. Yeah, we'd have to get off the stage. <laughs> no, no, but I, but I didn't, um, I didn't just walk on. I mean, I was invited. No, yeah, of no but I, I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, well, she but didn't, for she didn't the, walk for, on uninvited. She walked on after she was told, "Don't walk on." Yeah, well, right. then there's that, you know. But then that <laughs> that was when I was very young, so I would never do that now. And yeah. and it, it's it's really important to the to the young man that that had asked you the question when um, um, I think for for artists for those of us who are really uh, true to our music and our art. The thing that is most important for us is to keep pushing the envelope and to keep pushing ourselves to do something new, to keep challenging ourselves so that we are always renewing the, the, the energy and renewing the love and re renewing all of the, the wonderfulness that goes into being an artist. Um, I, 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 I feel that if the day that I stop trying to be creative is the day that I can check out. Mm -hmm. I want to push, mm -hmm. I want to push like so many musicians to push. Look, look at, um, oh Lord, I just lost the name, but there's so many musicians. Look at, look at Ray Brown who mm -hmm. played up until he went to play a game of golf and he had had a knee surgery and we had all said, right. Ray, don't, don't, Roy, don't go Roy, golf. Don't Roy go Haynes, out of the road. Roy Haynes is 95. Look at Roy Haynes. And yeah. still out there. <laughs> and don't tell them not to go. <laughs> right. 
Right. You know what I mean? And and Roy has dementia. Right. And I've been to a couple of his shows where there have been young people in the audience who don't know that he has dementia. And so he'll repeat himself, say the same thing after each song. And then there, there are these young people. Why does he keep repeating? You know? And But the beauty see, is see that happens. as soon he as he sits drum. down behind that drum, he, That's right. he doesn't but you know, forget anything. And, but, and you know, another thing is to, to, to realize like for me, I love my young people. Like I love Isaiah Thompson. Mm -hmm. All of that. I mean, I, they, he can play. He's serious. I, and look, when I see him, I hug him, and I tell him, "Look, man, people comfortable when you, when when you when you when you when you mean or you negative toward them. But I want to hug you because I want you to know the depth of the love." So when Chick came out on the stage, the type mm -hmm. of graciousness that he had and the love that he showed. Now we're talking seven seven eight months later, and he remembers that. He's saying, That's "Yeah, nice. beautiful young piano player was up there." And the way he played, and that's how we keep the feeling of the music going. Yeah. And that's, yes. that's what, what my man with his sons. Yeah, when I see people come with their sons or their fathers or yes. you know, their mothers, I always say, "Hey, that's your mama." You know, she's out here. It's eleven o'clock at night, and I, I always try to, because that's a special thing. You know, it and, is. And my mother died of dementia, so I, I just think of people's parents taking them to stuff and the type of love they have for their kids, and and the blessing we have to be able to interface. With, with with people and their children and to give them some love and a good feeling. They go home feeling right, like, yeah, we didn't like the music, but the guy was nice. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's exactly. Yes, then there's that. Oh, yes. we love the music. We love the music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing, man. I'm messing with you. But, you know, I know you. I love you. Just, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Wynn. Yeah, you're right. All right. Thanks, Robbie. Um, all right. Next question is from Sarah Frischer. Hi. Sarah, go ahead. Um, hi, Winston. Hey, hi. Hello, DD. I've been uh, spending a lot of time with Chick. Winton, you nurture me. Oh, I recognize me. you. You've been coming on the live stream. <laughs> I can't miss one evening. <laughs> yeah. I'm not so sure. I uh, have a question in as much as I was so happy to be in everybody's good company. Um, the word I had written down was integrity, which every one of you have, Dee Dee, Chick, and Winton, mm -hmm. and the fact that the way you nurture each other is that each musician should do his best so that the whole is yes. the best that it could be. Yes. And, um, in my life, I've had that pinned up on my walls. I've just escaped the regular uh, double screen uh, to go back to painting, which I always did. And um, with Chick's inspiration, I have actually been painting because oh, he right. says, do it. Hey, That's talk, talk wonderful. About your, thank you. Talk about your live stream, Chick. Uh, well, uh, I did it as a, a you know, I, I didn't know much about this fella here, <laughs> you know, and then uh, someone, because someone, I wasn't liking the sound on my old iPhone. So someone said, you ought to get a new iPhone. I'm not trying to promote iPhones, by the way, but but uh, I got a new one and the sound was so good. I thought, uh, gee, I'd like to uh, try and, you know, someone was talking about Facebook. I never got on Facebook ever. Uh, not my thing. But then someone showed me how to do it. I thought that'd be an interesting experiment. So I just put the phone up like that and and she showed me how to go on live and i just practiced i said well <laughs> if anyone's there i'm just going to practice and you know and i'd start no. to try a tune and uh you know and i was on for an hour and then i turned then when i learned how to look at it i saw a lot of people were tuning in <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but they were saying how nice it felt during the during this time to have uh, some something some music you know so i just kept doing it so today i finished uh day Mocha. 25 <laughs> <laughs> and i'm having a ball because you know when we were young uh, if if money if money is your basic motivation you you don't get too far you, you know mm -hmm. what i mean and we, mm -hmm. we didn't start out trying to make money we started out we started out because it was fun and it was engaging and it was something you really wanted to do and you get you know and then then getting older it turns out that that you see that other people uh, uh gain something positive by it when you get old enough to appreciate that which is i don't know it took me a while to appreciate that first it was all about me and then i started to see that other people enjoy it it makes you want to do, do it more and having fun so that's why i've been practicing on on facebook for 25 days 
Uh, That's <laughs> very cool, Chick. That's yeah, right. very cool. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Let's take another question. Uh, we've got one from Jeffrey Ocampo. Jeffrey, go ahead. Hi, uh, how are you guys doing? Um, I'm from Fort Lauderdale. Um, my question to you guys is, how do you guys, throughout the years that you guys have been playing professionally, how do you guys balance out your, your musical career with your life as in like starting a family or just having a social life in general? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you just do it. You do it. You just do it. You don't, it's, it's not something that I think that you can spend time thinking about. You, you're, you're concerned about um, making money when you start out. And so you're just trying to get gigs. You know that when you do those gigs, you got to, well, in my case, I had to get a babysitter. I didn't have money. I would take my, my, my first daughter with me to the gigs. I would ask the coat check lady, because back then we had coat checks. I would ask her if she would watch the baby while I would sing. And I would give her my bassinet and she would keep it in the, in the, in the coat check room. And I'd sing my songs and then I'd run and get my baby and then I'd go back into the kitchen. I mean, I think, and I, I say that to say that I think when you, when you want to do something bad enough, you figure out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But you have to want to do it. So I knew that I wanted to be a singer. I knew that I also wanted to be a mother. I figured it out. I made it work for me. Now, what I figured out may not work for another person, another woman, another man that, you know, wants to have children and, and, and have uh, a career. But I think that it's something that can apply to anything in life that you want to do. When you decide that you want to do that thing, you will work everything out. Mm -hmm. You will work yeah. everything out. And then you've got to remember that you are not alone mm -hmm. and that there are people around you that love you and that will help you. Mm -hmm. If they Amen. see that you are serious about that thing that you want to do. Talk about it. So whatever it is that you want to do in life, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Once you decide up here in your head that this is the thing that you want to do, you can do it. Uh -huh. Then you just set about doing it and, and it just works itself out. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that there may be some, some issues that, that, that result from it. I mean, like my, my children suffered a little bit, but here they are now, all my kids are adults and they landed on their two feet. So it's all about your choices, I think, you know, and, and uh, doing things that you really truly believe in. If you're passionate, there, it has to, there has to be some passion in it. If you're passionate about the thing that you wanna do, then I think that you can figure out a way to balance your, your personal life and, and your, your professional life. But I will say this, it ain't easy. <laughs> right. It ain't easy. But you can I do it. One, I got one comment to add. All mm -hmm. the BB says is true for me too. Uh, but uh, I got a very simple comment to add that if you lose your dream, you lose your future and you, you lose your life. All you've got is your dream. So if you compromise with your dream, you ain't got much left. There we go. There we go. You just got to be able to envision other people as a part of it if you have a family. Yeah. And it's, it's nothing you do is not going to be sacrificed. Like it, it doesn't matter what. That sacrifice is always a part of it for them and for you. That's, I mean, that's all you, part, got, you that's can just look at your, your, you know, our, our parents. Look at, you know, or you know, other adults, you know, when you were growing up and how those people were able to manage their lives, mm. you know, so it's, 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 it's no different. Perhaps it might be a little bit more complicated today because we are just pulled in so many different ways. Um, but as, as Chick said, you gotta be, it's the, if you don't dream, if you don't have a dream, what is the life? You got to, you've, you've got to, I always say to kids, dream and dream big. The bigger your dreams, the better it's going to be when you realize. Hey, you know what? Don't you think, all, oh, oh, don't you think. And then also, when you realize those dreams, dream some more. Don't you think also that the, that the mm -hmm. actual, the actual doing, the actual doing of it is the pay. It's not, yes. a, it's not the end of the gig or the applause or the money. 
it's like the doing of it. You know, when I'm writing, when I'm writing music and I'm, I've got my pencil and I've got my score paper and I've got my piano and I'm touching these things and I'm, I'm moving this pencil around and I'm, I'm pressing the keys. That's the shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. We've heard that word. Yeah. That's we got to put a beat on it and make it into a song. <laughs> yeah that's yeah, right it's the doing of it and you got, gotta you gotta have if it ain't fun it ain't worth doing right because yeah. with any with any dream or something you have you don't know you don't know that you're gonna attain that and then when you have a collective dream you also don't know about that mm -hmm. like you could achieve something personally but you might have a dream for you and a and a lot of other people you may have a dream for your neighborhood or your country or your family or mm -hmm. your or the world and it's, it's just like Martin Luther King said, he had a dream. We so far away from realizing that, but what should he have not had the dream? I mean, somebody like me is a result of part of his dream. Mm -hmm. And many of us, many of us, mm -hmm. you know, some of us mm -hmm. suffered because of it. Some of us had great advantages. Some of us, you know, and there's, we, there are many dreams going on on earth all the time. And, you know, we, 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 we got to go down that road, you know, you got to go, just like that, that old song, you got to walk that lonesome valley. Yeah. yeah. You get other people to dream with you, they're not always in your family. That's right. You know, your I family comes all of that, in, in a lot of forms. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the reason I asked is just, that's my biggest concern. I'm only 16, but like I said, once, once I go into this professional journey or hopefully one day, um, that's probably one of my biggest concerns just because I see like I see you Mr. Marsalis you're always you usually when I see you you're usually always on the road so I always wonder how do you maintain a family while you're always on the road don't so, worry about it you can't you can't <laughs> well you're 16 yeah so yes. you 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 yes. should not even be <laughs> no no plenty of time I know I know I know don't use me as an example <laughs> <laughs> I will give you some good advice <laughs> do not use me as an example but you know when I was when I was young I always had my older kids always would be on the road with me man and you know, now they're 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 uh, they're thirty two and thirty, and I mean they're they're grown, and it's like it's like what DB said. You gotta you gotta bring you gotta you gotta bring people with you. Like I, you know, when I grew up, my father was at home. He always wanted to be out on the road. And he sacrificed a lot for us. He just was there, and it, it, it was a lot of us. And I always make the point: our family life was not like Ozzy and Harriet. <laughs> it was it had all the kind of challenges and dysfunctions that people at that time and era had. And with my family life and everything, I have all the challenges and dysfunctions that people in my type of situation have. But that is what the definition of life is. There's no uh, fool, foolproof plan. The only thing I can tell you is try to avoid doing things that you know are stupid. Do, when you know something is stupid, don't do it. Don't, don't tell yourself, this is stupid, but I'm going to do it anyway. Don't do it. When oh, you know man, it's stupid, man. don't do it because then you're going to tell yourself, man, I knew this was stupid. I did it because the, the most harm is going to come to things you do yourself. That's the one piece of advice I'm going to give you. Amen. Don't do things you know are stupid. Settle to things that you think are stupid, not that you know. And uh, a family is the most beautiful thing you can I'm going to say a family is the most beautiful thing you can have. You know, it's the most beautiful have thing you, you can have. Have. have you had enough advice now? Yeah. Of course, yes, sir. Thank you. It's Thank never you, enough. Chief. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chick. I appreciate right. it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. That's right. Thank you, man. Practice that horn, too. All right, guys. We've got time for just one more. Um, want to remind everybody quickly, we've got a, a, a lot, pretty good lineup that's continuing of, of uh, question and answer sessions with Winton, master classes, conversations with members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. Um, that, that's going to continue to go on in the coming days and weeks. Um, our last question will be coming from a friend of Jazz at Lincoln Center's. She's a great musician and vocalist. Alexis Morast, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Girl, Hello. Girl, you should be in bed. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's past your bedtime. Uh, yes, Alexis! Hi. <laughs> Hi. Oh, Alexis, Alexis, Alexis. I it's love you, Alexis. I love you too. Oh this girl should be Lord. sleeping. Oh, people, 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 you need to check Alexis out. Oh, my Lord. What a blessed child. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she is. Thank She's you. a blessing. She, where, where's your mom and daddy? Tell them, uh, did you, do they know you up? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my dad is listening in with me, and my mom is uh, she's around the house doing something. Tell, give my love. I most definitely will. Um, I just want to thank you guys for doing this. This is such a wonderful thing that you're doing for everybody, especially with everyone going through you know the hard times that we're in right now. This is just a way to brighten everybody's spirit. But I had some questions for uh, Miss Bridgewater um, about repertoire building. Uh, first and then building a brand um, with me being a young musician and already having some experience under my belt but with still a whole lot left to learn um, I find it challenging sometimes just to to stay uh, caught up with all of you know the music there's so much to listen to and so many options to choose from um, but I just wanted to know how you continuously build your repertoire and then when it comes to making sure that, you know, you have something that makes you who you are. You know, the first time I met you, I was, I was taken back. You were such a beautiful woman. You came in with the funky glasses and the boots and the hat. And <laughs> I, was, I was taken back, but it, that made you who you are. And I, I think I'm in all of this, I'm trying to build my musicianship, but also find my voice in everything else that's going on. Well, okay. Alexis, in terms of, of building your musicianship and building your repertoire, it's very simple. You just have to, to do material that speaks to you, that speaks to your spirit, because that is the material that you are going to be able to really breathe life into. So I just try and find songs that tell stories that touch me, that move me, and, and that I feel will move other people. Because if I'm moved and I believe in something, then it's going to be much easier for me to convince people who have come to share an evening with me that that, that thing is real. You know, um, so right. a lyric is really important. I don't know how that is for you. Do you, do, you, do, do you choose songs because of the story that the songs are telling? Um, I think it would be 50-50. I choose it because it has a significant meaning to me when it comes to lyrics, but then if the music is great, I, I also choose because of that. Um, I move mm -hmm. by a lot of things when it comes to music. I am a vocalist, but because I've, I've grown up with my dad, who's a, a piano player and, and an mm -hmm. organist, and I've been around. They can play. He right. Can play I, I listen for. Skip over. He can play. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, Alexis, when I was starting out, I, I was like that too. So I would pick songs because I dug the melody. Maybe the story was trite. But because I was just trying to build my chops, you know, and I was, because for me, when I was growing up, I was trying to do the scatting. Scatting isn't as important um, as it used to be um, to, to be a jazz singer, but um, it's okay to pick a tune because you like the melody. Right. You know, and, and, and not so much because of the story. So, but as long as the song has some kind of meaning to you, then, then that's going to come across when you do that song. Okay. And okay. then in and then in terms of your brand, baby, you young, please. You are young. So your brand, your look, all of that is going to be in constant flux until you get to a point where you can can settle and be really comfortable about the who that you have created and and, and the look that you have created and and then it will just be second nature to you. So you're, you're young, so you're learning. So what I would say to you is just be the you that you are today. Thank you. <laughs> be the you that you are today, because tomorrow you're going to wake up and you might feel another kind of way. Right. So, so then what people are going to perceive is all these different facets of you. And then eventually it's going to all come together and it's going to create your brand, your image, you know, but just keep being the you that you are and doing the things that you like and dressing how you like and how you feel comfortable. Just keep doing that, honey. You're too young to, for it to, to be completely solidified. I'm 70 the end of May. It, it, and, and I've been doing this for, for 50 years. I've been doing this. So the Dee Dee Bridgewater that I am today, that I am in this particular moment with all of you tonight, 
is, is, is the culmination of my 70 years on this earth and my 50 years as an entertainer and making mistakes and picking myself up and doing it again, you know, and, and you're talking about um, um, bad reviews, bad, bad critiques. People used to critique me because they would put me down because I moved on the stage. How dare a singer move? They they put me down because I was changing up my repertoire. Who did I think I was? They would say a musician. Right. Because a singer is supposed to, for some reason, as the singer, we're supposed to stay in one lane. I refused. So now as a result of that, and, and for me, weathering all of the bad criticism, not listening to it, just keeping on my path, on my truth, I have arrived at a place today where all of those years and all those experiences have created this individual that is sitting here with you tonight. And um, the other thing that I would say is, Alexis, continue to walk without fear. Okay. And if you have Thank fear, you. you have got to push through that fear. Thank You've you. You've got to dive in that water. It may be cold and it may be deep. And you may struggle, but you will come out in the end. So you, you, you've just got to, to, to do those things that you feel, um, operate on those feelings when you feel them, mm -hmm. dress how you want to dress. that makes you feel comfortable. Be you. There's only one you. There's nobody else like you mm -hmm. in the whole wide world. And that's it. Period. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. It's because lovely listen to see to me, you again. Baby. Here, listen to me. You are you. You have a a, a sense of of the music, and you have a sense of stage, and you have a sense of yourself that is uncanny for someone as young as you are. So you are already. Um, <laughs> That's true. It, you isn't ain't lying. It? Oh, you you ain't lying about that. So she, you are she, already she, on the on on the right path. Thank so you. Just keep just keep going there, baby, and don't be afraid. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yes. And uh, the other, the last thing is don't be afraid to fall. Mm. You can pick yourself back up. Okay. That's right. All right. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. All You're right. so fabulous. Thank you. So are you. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Marcellus. And I've never had the opportunity of meeting you, Mr. Korea, but I have seen you play live once at, a, what was it, BB Kings with Layla Hathaway. And I must say, you are incredible, sir. Incredible. Thank you so much. And, uh, and my dad, my dad loves you. My dad is like a cheerleader. Uh, <laughs> I, look, I, look for, I look forward to hearing you. Nice Absolutely. Oh, chick, you nice love her. You love you her. Go. Yeah, she can sing, chick. Yeah. yeah. Hey, don't really, forget about she that. Can sing. She don't can forget sing. about she that intellectual sing. development. <laughs> don't forget right. about those books, that intellectual development. <laughs> Listen, I still got to get with you so we can study. Well, let's go. You know, Listen, all we got I, I, is time now. We locked hey, in the coming, house. But I can't come by the house now. We we quarantined, but I'm coming over there and get my get my uh, my Sunday dinner. <laughs> but we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. <laughs> we're gonna see about the black eyed peas and the red bees and all of that. Ooh, yes, we're ready. We we are ready. Y'all get ready. We're gonna see. We're all gonna right. see Thank you guys so much. Right. I really appreciate all the Thank advice. You. Oh, Thank you, you are so welcome, Alexis. Yeah, Thank you. That's beautiful. Oh my goodness, Thank you, Alexis. Yeah, you are gonna love her, chick. Oh really, chick? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Amazing. All right, guys. Um, I think that's about all the time we have for tonight. I um, want to say thanks again to everybody for joining us, um, to our supporters and donors. We can't thank you enough. Uh, I'd also like to mention that Jazz at Lincoln Center's Gala, a worldwide concert for our culture, is premiering this Wednesday, April 15th at 7.30 p.m. We'll be having guest performances from some of the world's greatest musicians representing 11 different countries around the globe, in addition to a few performances from the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. You can go to jazz.org slash gala2020 for all the info. I'll put that in the chat right now as well. Um, jazz.org slash gala2020. And we hope you'll tune in on Wednesday. Um, so thanks again to Chick Korea, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Wynton Marsalis, and all of you for joining us. Um, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Hey, right. Wynton, thanks for thank you. Inviting yeah, me. man, I'm going to write you. Thank you. Dee Dee, thank you all. Thank you, Wynton. Thank you so much. Thank much you, love. Chick. Love Much love. All right. right now.
Look out, Adam. We got work to do tonight. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. Okay. Good night, everyone, and stay safe. Good night.